Is uh, never bought. Uh, could you uh, get uh, share your screen with us? Uh, make sure everything's working. Um, yeah, Devavat, if you, if you um, look back at his history, he uh, was a star uh, grad student at MIT, and then uh, all his awards, one after one, were labeled as rising star or something similar. And so now I think it can be called an official star at MIT in statistical inference, machine learning, operations research, and um, fantastic uh, teacher as well. So look forward to your talk. Right, well, Sean, thanks for a kind introduction. Uh, I guess I, uh, since my first year, grad, first year in grad school, I remember your talk at the Stochastic Networks. Mm -hmm. And since then, it's been a pleasure following you. Um, so with that, uh, I'm going to uh, talk about uh, a method for uh, Q-learning in a data efficient manner uh, using a matrix estimation uh, approach. And here, uh, the key result is that if you view um, the traditional Q function in the MDPs as a kernel of an operator, then turns out there is a nice way to define the spectral representation of it, uh, and which could lead to utilizing the traditional matrix estimation approach as a subroutine to obtain uh, efficient uh, Q learning method. And as I walk through the talk, I will talk about um, the spectral representation and uh, how that fits nicely with uh, the matrix estimation. And my hope is that this talk would present um, an avenue to uh, further exploration rather than uh, a complete results. Uh, I feel that sort of many of the results here are the first take on the question and hopefully uh, there will be a great venue to get both feedback as well as find uh, many of the uh, many of the bright ones as an audience uh, thinking about the next set of questions. Uh, this is based on a thesis of uh, Dog Yun Song and Zi Zhu, who are uh, graduate students at MIT, along in collaboration with Yu Zhe Yang. Uh, all right, so with that, let me get started. And again, goes without saying that, uh, please feel free to um, ask me questions. Feel free to unmute yourself at any point of time uh, and interrupt me. Okay, so this is based on um, uh, the manuscript uh, uh, titled Sample Efficient RL with Low Rank Matrix Estimation. Uh, it's going to appear in Europe's this year and also um, it's available on the archive. Okay, so just to set things up, as we have seen many times um, in this uh, uh, meeting, uh, we're going to talk about uh, the standard MDP framework. We're going to consider infinite horizon discounted uh, setting. That is, we've got the state space S, action sp space A, the transition kernel, uh, got a reward function, and then the discount factor. Okay. Um, as we know, uh, if there's a policy pi that maps state to action, we define the value function as this. And of course, uh, the optimal value function is the one that is achieved through an optimal policy. And again, there exists a nice clean optimal policy that leads to the definition of this as a value function. Um, another quantity of interest uh, has been uh, discussed many times in the meeting is the Q function, in particular, the optimal Q function. And optimal Q function defines the Bellman's equation. That is, it's simply now instead of value function uh, equations of state and action, and then defined in this natural recursive manner. Okay, and of course, uh, the value function at a given state is nothing but uh, the maximum over or supremum over A for Q defined at that state. And of course, this Q function, the nice thing about it is it gives you explicitly what policy is, and um, that's defined as this uh, equation. So really, one way to think about uh, RL is simply look for uh, estimating Q or Q star. That is, we would like to learn an approximation of Q star, which is minimizing with respect to the infinity norm. And that will be our goal. Now, um, since Bellman's equation uh, has a fixed point as Q star in such setting, 
naturally gives rise to the traditional Q learning policy. And here is one version of Q learning that I'm writing down, where if I am observing data uh, in terms of sequence of states, actions, rewards, and then the next states, then um, I could iteratively update my Q function estimate uh, by simply looking at equations such as this. And again, you want to sort of choose the right uh, step size so that the convergence happens, but at the same time, accumulation happens as well. Okay, so, so far so good. Um, this is a quick uh, recap of the context. The key question of interest in uh, this work is coming up with estimation of uh, Q star. Uh, in particular, we want to find Q hat so that it's um, infinity norm error is less than epsilon in a data efficient manner. So what is data here? Data here is the number of simulation steps. So in this setup, I'm going to assume access to a, a simulation environment that is given state and action. I could simulate from the underlying model what the next state would be and what the reward associated would be. Okay. So the question is that how many simulation steps do I need to obtain such an estimator? Um, I'm going to uh, focus on um, uh, continuous state space. That is, number of states are infinite in that sense. Uh, but we'll consider a nice compact sets. Uh, in particular, for simplicity, think of uh, the state being a unit interval in D1 dimension, and state uh, action would be uh, the 0, 1 to power D2 in uh, another dimension. And again, if, you, if it's easy, just think of D1 equals to D2 equals to some fixed D. Okay. And again, our interest would be understanding the sample complexity with respect to um, the scaling of epsilon and D. Now I see there is a Q&A uh, question. Uh, not sure sort of if I should uh, pause and figure out how to look at it. Okay. So uh, Gergo asked, is there any particular reason for using infinity norm? Uh, well, uh, one is, well, it's a best type or tightest form of um, approximation error one could get. And also having um, Q infinity norm, because we're going to use the Q hat to define a policy, it also gives me how much error would I have if I made a decision based on the Q, uh, Q hat. So that's uh, the reason why I'm thinking about Q infinity norm. I hope Gergo it answers your question. Okay, so I'm going to continue. Um, I'm going to assume that sort of MDPs have uh, optimal Q function, which is Lipschitz, uh, defined this way. And again, um, there's simple generic conditions that will lead to on the problem setup that will lead to such a property on uh, a Q function. Okay, now under such setting, um, there's a, a nice minimax lower bounds exist for this problem, uh, which says that sort of the number of samples required must scale as epsilon to power minus D1 plus D2 plus two, as it scales both with the dimensions of state space and action space in this, man in this manner. More precisely, uh, if it's finite state, then it's a simply a product of state and action space. And one way to think about uh, why these two results are identical is because if you are thinking about learning uh, Q star within epsilon error, one way to do that, at least roughly speaking, is take the states and action space and uh, simply um, uh, discretize or quantize them within epsilon, and that will lead to um, uh, the number of, let's say, cells in that quantization uh, scaling as epsilon to power minus D1 for S and epsilon to power minus D2 for A for these reasons. And there's a plus two here that happens. And this type of lower bound, one way to think about them is to simply reduce the traditional uh, 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 non-parametric uh, regression questions or function learning. Now, Again, these are minimax, and hence these are adversarial pessimistic. But in practice, one would hope that there are many situations where MDPs do have some structure. And if they do have some structure, hopefully, maybe we could utilize that structure in a meaningful manner and improve upon such bounds. So 
To paraphrase this, one way to ask question is that are there representations for MDPs that allow us to define some notion of parametric complexity? And as that parameter changes, complexity of MDP changes, which translates effectively into more or less data requirement. Okay. And with this as a motivation, um, uh, what in this work we do is we try to uh, pursue one such representation and one such representation uh, is what we'll call the traditional spectral representation. So what we're thinking about is again, uh, a more generic abstract setting would be that you got um, a state and action space, which are endowed with appropriate metric, are uh, compact metric spaces with finite measures. Uh, there is a bounded reward function and as I mentioned earlier, the Q function is Lipschitz with respect to these uh, metric. Now, if we think of Q star, uh, which is a function of uh, state and action, think of this as a kernel inducing an operator, an operator on the L2 space from uh, action space to the state space, then um, under these conditions, one can write down a nice simple uh, clean um, singular value decomposition of such um, uh, such Q star, which has a countable uh, representation. There is a number of components in its representation are countably infinite. Further, the singular values associated with them are square summable, which means that in that sense, energy is always finite. Now, we hope that this result is known in some form somewhere, uh, not necessarily in the context of Q star, but at least in the generalized singular value decomposition sense. Try to look for literature, of course, for the well-known for symmetric, for asymmetric setting, which is what Q star is. Just had to work, work it out from basic principles. But again, but again I'm pretty sure there is a, a appropriate reference somewhere. Uh, one implication of this is that if you, for any given Q star, for any delta greater than zero, there will exist a finite rank R of delta, such that if I truncated this um, expansion to top R's uh, components, then in this L2 sense, it will be uh, within uh, error delta. Okay, so which means that not only uh, this has um, a finite energy, because of that finite energy, it has um, a finite rank approximation with approximation error delta for any given delta. Of course, the question is that how fast does R of delta decay as a function of delta? That's an interesting study. And for, um, uh, anyways, I'll leave that as an interesting uh, question to think about. But there are a few things we know um, for a nice analytic functions and so on and so forth, but I'm going to sort of uh, spare us from that for the time being. Okay, uh, now with this in the tradition, the way we think of uh, rank, uh, I would define rank of Q star as the smallest i beyond which the singular values are zero or delta rank in this sense. Okay, if there's any questions, please feel free to stop me or post it on q and I'll try to see if I can monitor. Okay, so with that, um, just to remind us that sort of this, uh, what happens to some of the classical questions like classical LQR or linear quadratic regular setting where, you know, we have a linear system. Um, and in this case, let's say state and action space are in D1 and D2 dimension as defined before. Okay, um, we have a quadratic cost or negative reward. Um, and of course, in this case, as we know, uh, policies of interest are linear policies that would lead to the Q function uh, that has a nice uh, explicit form and uh, a moment or two of deliberation would convince you that in this case, the this Q function for any pi has a finite rank. In particular, the rank is a minimum of the D1 plus D1 comma D2 plus two. And so indeed, there are examples where uh, the optimal uh, Q function has finite rank. 
And as we discussed for uh, any Lipschitz skew function, uh, the delta rank is finite. Okay, so with this, um, here is the overview of main result. So if we assume that the optimal Q function is finite rank and discount factor gamma is small enough, smaller than a predefined constant uh, or universal constant, then um, uh, the sample complexity of learning Q star within epsilon with respect to infinity norm scales as one over maximum of D1 comma D2. So for simplicity, let's think of D1 equals to D2. Then it says, this is scales like epsilon to power minus D plus, sorry, minus D minus two compared to a lower bound, which is 2D. So in a sense, we go from two times D to single D. And again, that's happening is because we have a finite rank. And there is a, uh, within here, there is a constant hidden that depends on rank R. So of course, if R goes to infinity, this result would become vacuous in some sense, you would uh, lead to this one or other uh, bounds such as this. Uh, in the context of finite state in action, what this would mean is that instead of having a multiplicative bound, it would have the max of S comma A in the same manner. So again, uh, this is because the Q function is finite rank and discount factor is small enough. Again, okay, bunch of references associated with these are here. Go to uh, move on. So how does how does this work? So in next 10 minutes or so, I'll try to uh, quickly go through the key ideas of how the low rank representation of Q star in, in this uh, uh, spectral uh, sense leads to efficient Q learning algorithm. So the first insight was that, well, if we have some finite set of states uh, and finite set of actions, and if we simply look at the Q function evaluated those finite states and actions, so not infinite, but finite, then if you look at a matrix with uh, rows being the finitely sam many sampled states and columns being finitely many sampled actions and Q star of S comma A being the entry of that matrix, and because the Q star is finite rank in the way we defined, the sampled version or sampled matrix is has a finite rank, uh, in particular rank no more than R in the traditional um, matrix sense. So if you have finite rank, and if you know exact value for uh, it's a roughly R times the maximum of the dimension of the matrix, then the traditional matrix estimation literature would suggest that we should be able to recover all the entries um, uh, pretty accurately. So that means that sort of only by having to estimate, let's say n by n entries, there's n square entries, we needed access to only order n entries. So the question is that how can we, uh, um, why not apply that as an approach? The few challenges are that, well, we don't have direct access to Q star because that's what we're trying to estimate. And that recursively depends on each other. And second is the state and actions uh, spaces are not finite. And so we need to somehow figure out, iteratively refine and achieve this. And that's precisely what we do. So in pictures, roughly the algorithm looks something like this. So we're trying to do uh, effectively Q learning, but in a specific manner. Okay. So let's suppose we, so we, again, these are the inputs. You start with some initialization and so initially you have a continuous state space on which you have some initial iterate Q naught. First we do is that we discretize the state space. And so you've got finite set of states and finite set of actions. And this is the matrix of interest. For this matrix of interest, what we're going to do, and that's the quantization. Okay. The next step, what we're going to do is we're going to do exploration in particular for a subset of entries in this matrix in a specific manner, we would choose the state and action, which corresponds to one of the action entries here. We'll draw NT uh, appropriately defined um, simulations from the simulator that we have access to. And using that, we'll getting um, NT samples for the next state. And using that along with the reward, 
here I'm assuming it's deterministic, but let's say if not average, uh, we produce a new estimate with the estimate that we had from the previous iteration. Okay, and again, since there's a discount factor, if we had some error before, discount, that discount factor shrinks that error by some amount. Of course, there is some error because of um, averaging, but let's say it's not the case, then sort of definitely this discounting helps reduce some error that was there from previous step. So that means that we started with some estimation here of Q function. On these sampled states, our error has reduced by some amount. However, we have only access to these few sample states and actions, not everything. We'll utilize the matrix estimation to um, complete this entries in matrix. In the process, we might lose on some of the gains that we made through this step. But hopefully, if you have a good estimation, good matrix estimation procedure, this loss may not be too much. And once we have these sampled things, and because these sampling or this quantization was done carefully with uh, appropriate uh, method, uh, general um, interpolation method, for example, like just here, we just used nearest neighbors, uh, it would generalize reasonably well. And again, so there'll be some loss in this generalization also. So we gained, we lost and we lost, but hopefully the losses made are less than the gains uh, made here. Then effectively in this end of this one loop, we went from uh, QT minus one to QT by improving in terms of our uh, accuracy of reducing the error. Now I see that there's one more, there's a question in Q&A. So let me stop there for a second and see what the question is. So Yudong asked question, hi Yudong, good to see you online. Uh, when the action space is small, say one and two, does this approach achieve better sample complexity than tabular approach? Well, uh, the short answer Yudong is no, because then a matrix estimation that the gain you are obtaining uh, are definitely uh, disappearing, uh, as you know, because you want both dimension to scale well. So thank you for asking the question. Okay, uh, I'm going to continue um, um, uh, with the uh, description. Okay, so another way to look at the same algorithm is that you start with some iteration. First, you go from that iteration and reduce the error, okay, uh, by uh, through exploration. And then you maybe gain, uh, lose a little bit um, when you go from this estimation through matrix estimation, and you lose a little bit more when you go to generalization. But hope is that as you're going from here to here to here, you are gaining and working towards your ultimate Q star. Okay, so in summary, here's the type of result you can obtain through a method like this. That if you have a matrix estimation method, which for, so matrix of interest is M, um, you have sampled this matrix for a small subset of entries. These entries may have some error. And let's say this is the infinity norm error restricted to the observed entries with respect to M and M hat. So that means that the error is arbitrary. From this M hat, you obtain M bar using the matrix estimation such that M bar minus the original M in infinity norm is some constant factor times the error in your observations. Okay. And let's assume that you can achieve this by observing such entries for a subset of entries which scales uh, edit linearly in the two dimensions with some another constant. If you have access to such an oracle of matrix estimation, which we'll call as satisfying capital C, small c matrix estimation property. Then we can, uh, for choices of uh, quantization, number of samples and the iteration at each step to construct that exploration, can come up with a method that allows us to produce estimation of Q star at the teeth iteration with respect to infinity norm uh, that decays uh, exponentially with this constant. Now, when I'm saying it decays, I'm assuming that this is true. 
So this is where it was when I sort of stated overview of the result, I said gamma should be less than some universal constant. That is this universal constant, which comes from the matrix estimation. And clearly, um, this uh, CME has to be greater than or equal to one uh, because that's the worst case adversarial error we might have. So that means that gamma has to be less than or equal to half. Now, of course, this is, uh, if we tighten the analysis, then we can make gamma as close to one over CME as possible. Question is that can we have a method that achieves CME close to one? Well, if we observe all the entries, yes, that is feasible. But the whole point is that we don't want to observe all entries. We want to observe only linear number of entries in the dimension, not the quadratic. And questions are what is the best trade-off you can achieve? Uh, more precisely, a question that would uh, you would ask is that: Is it feasible to achieve? Uh, is it is it feasible for such an uh, oracle to exist? Because in existing matrix lit estimation literature, such a matrix estimation did not exist. Anyways, um, what we do argue in the in, in our paper is that yes, there is such a matrix estimation method that does exist. Uh, using that with appropriate choice, we can achieve uh, the results that we claimed earlier. Okay. So one interesting question that remains uh, open is that, well, we have achieved such, um, uh, shown the existence of such a thing for potentially not optimized constants. The question is what are the optimal constants you can achieve for such a matrix estimation uh, requirement that remains uh, an uh, interesting question and um, it's sort of a kind of a nice tie up between the reinforcement learning method and the matrix estimation literature. In uh, one minute, I'll quickly show how it works in uh, some of the simple experiments. So again, this is uh, one of the simplest examples as we know of in inverted pendulum, sort of defining and reminding us, I'll just quickly walk you through the type of results, empirical results we get. So what I'm showing here is the infinity norm error. And here is the number of samples in 10 to power seven times the number of that. And as you can see with matrix estimation based approach, this error decays quickly versus this is the standard uh, baseline uh, uh, Q learning approach. Okay, and again, so this happens for gamma equals to 0.5, gamma equals to 0.9. And this is just for L1 error. So the takeaway is that while our results were the, true for small gamma, uh, in practice, they work for gamma getting close to one, it seemed to suggest that maybe our analysis is uh, weaker rather than uh, the method itself. Uh, this is showing the same thing, but instead of using the method that we proposed, other uh, matrix estimation method, while these methods don't have guarantees, at least provably known guarantees, work almost as good as the best uh, R approach. So uh, in particular, I would like to call out nuclear norm minimization, which seemed to be by a little bit, but constantly outperforming our approach. It's uh, definitely something to uh, worth proving that uh, type of guarantee. This is just a visual plot of the method showing that it works uh, It works what it promises. All right, so with that, I'm close to the end of my time. Um, again, uh, the key takeaway is that spectral representation provides a nice parametric way of thinking about complexity. Uh, there's a nice connection to low rank matrix estimation with different types of uh, guarantees and hopefully uh, uh, folks might be, might sort of find better ways to prove tighter guarantees there. And going forward, just characterizing MDPs that have such low rank or approximate low rank structure uh, would be a great set of uh, questions to look at. So let me pause here. Oh, fantastic. Um, I'm sure there must be lots of questions, not in Q and A, but out there. So um, could you go back to, you You rushed past that, that visualization, um, the visualization of the policies was that or the, um, uh, yeah, the, um, I was just wondering if, if it if you smooth things or introduce um, um, noise when you do this. I, I just wonder how, empirically what you found in terms of the kind of distortion oh. that you see. You, you well, mean here? Not these plots, but you had a visualization of a policy. 
I guess we should maybe a last plot. Oh, I see here. You mean like there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I just saw a red flag there with all the. Your, so your method, yeah. So this is, this is yeah, just a few ruffles. I yeah. just I'd love to see what happens with something like mountain car, where the value function is very non-smooth, and if this uh, smooths it, if it, it makes it blow up or something like that. Um, yeah. So we yeah. we tried with few examples, and again, it's it's very similar uh, behavior. But again, sort of we have not tried with very complicated examples. Oh, right. And, the, and is there any way to like, so either take cost information to account or, you know, or, or the, or a smoothness somehow try to have a smooth mm -hmm. fire or something like that, you know? Yeah. So for example, that. one way to argue that, let's say, um, a Q, something like this kind of guarantee, um, Q function is Lipschitz is to have appropriate property of, yeah. of the reward function and the the transition kernel. So you've got that in there, but you're not and using that in your model or your algorithm, are you? Sorry? Those, those are used to obtain uh, bounds, right? Exactly. So if, for example, one way to guarantee this kind of smoothness of Q star would be to, to via the smoothness of reward function and the transition kernel. Oh, sure. no, what I meant was, does your algorithm respect the Lipschitz constant or do you get something roughly? Ah, good. Um, okay, so I don't remember. So, but we, I think the dependence on constants like Lipschitz constant and the rank are not, uh, let's call it the very respectable. Yeah, right, right, sure. So they're constants, but uh, I, I do believe that there might be room to improve them uh, as well. Um, there's a, a nice comment here in the Q&A. Um, the category of Lachowski decomposition or similar methods might help. Sorry, so, okay. Do you think category, uh, category of Cholesky? Well, so I think um, um, it's a great question. There's sort of what sorts of matrix estimation method would help. So um, this is a particularly hard setup because we are thinking of the following thing that I have a matrix M. I'm going to give you observation where each observation has an error. And the error is bounded, but it's adversarial. So there is no, it may, it may be, it may have a serious biases. And the question is that with such an adversarial setting, how would you recover the original matrix for all the entries with, re, while retaining the same amount of adversarial error? Maybe blown up by a constant factor, but not by much. And that is a hard problem. Um, we could sort of find that by uh, selecting the appropriate sort of uh, query points in the matrix. Um, and it would be really interesting to sort of analyze other methods with respect to this uh, a very, uh, very strong requirement. For example, we, I be we believe that sort of nuclear norm minimization must have some such property, but it's uh, at least we found it hard to prove. Yeah. But, but what are the comment of our, so gamma was your discount factor, right? That's correct. So, so the uh, question of how to uh, remove dependency on the discount factor was the topic yes. of Aditya Devaraj's talk yesterday. So you might want to look at his, the relative Q function. It's a great it's, suggestion. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anything else out there? I guess not. Well, let, let's all thank uh, Devaraj. Uh, Devaraj, sorry. And um, and uh, if there are, any, I mean, of course, uh, contact all the uh, speakers. And um, if you have questions, and uh, come back on, tomorrow. We'll have a, another very interdisciplinary um, day. Um, you know, people from control and, and RL, and be a, a panel as well, which is going to be good. Um, and if you have any questions, by the way, for the panelists tomorrow, send them to us in advance. You know, just uh, all the entropy, the, the more entropy, the better. Um, the panel yesterday was basically, let's find out what Chaba knows. That was sort of the theme. Um, and so we're, gonna, we're not going to have that theme tomorrow. We're going to have a different theme. Um, <laughs> so same question. Yeah. That's great. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thank you. Great to see thanks, you. Thanks, It's just a shame you're not, uh, we're not in Berkeley. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. I wish it was Berkeley. Yeah.
at least it will be nice and warm. Yeah, <laughs> even here, all the trees warm you know, in Florida. So, all right. Okay. Ciao.